it's been so difficult to just figure out what the best way to do, what, what the right way to, to go about this vaccine has been. Um, but in a lot of ways, we're in a so much better place now than we ever were, because now uh, we have real world data from this vaccine. So now we have, we see what the vaccine has done when it's been given to millions of people in the population. And in a lot of ways, the real world data has vindicated this vaccine. You remember the initial clinical trials, they were a bit confusing. There was an inconsistency in the dosing, the dosing interval. They didn't have people over 65, still didn't have people with some of those severe comorbidities in the initial clinical trial. But now, this is why NACI has also changed the recommendations, is because we have now data from millions of people in the UK, Scotland, Europe, having been given the vaccine and now we know that the vaccine is actually a really good vaccine it's here it just uh, we'll see if we can get dr constant and ask you back we've just been having a little bit of kind of oh well, she's back sorry about that we just lost you for a moment carry on uh, so we now have all this data from real world in terms of it being given to millions of people that we know that even after one dose, it's really good at preventing hospitalizations and death. So now we can go back and say, OK, now that we know more, we can go ahead and recommend it in more people uh, in our population. So overall, in some ways, vindicated by the real world data, which is in millions of people that it has been given. All right. So reassurance from you as we begin our questions, and there are so many, I better hop to them right away. Joyce wonders uh, something about blood clots. That, of course, the issue that they're investigating in Europe. Why have blood clots been associated with the AstraZeneca, AstraZeneca vaccine and none of the others? If the occurrence of clots in the normal number that appears in the general public, in fact, it's I believe research shows it's below what the general public number is, then shouldn't there be a similar number of clots showing up with all of the vaccines? Yeah, that's a great question. So just so we remind people, we're talking about 37 cases in 5 million doses of the vaccine. Interestingly, in the 11 million in the UK, they hadn't seen the signal. Um, the numbers, though, are similar in all the vaccines. So we've seen that when they looked back in terms of the mRNA vaccines as well, the numbers seem to be across board similar in terms of blood clot. Um, and again, just like you said, if you took 5 million people, you'd expect 5,000 to 15,000 cases of, um, of blood clots versus the 37 that were noted. So if anything, even in this vaccine, in the, in the vaccine population, uh, the vaccinated population, they seem to be lower uh, based baseline rate than you would in the general population. But um, it's, they've, you know, this is similar across board with all the other vaccines as well. Same with the other vaccines. Okay, we're getting a number of questions from people related to the blood clot issue. So I'm going to group this, uh, these three together, doctor. People who have a history of uh, deep vein thrombosis. So number one, uh, Re the AstraZeneca vaccine. I have a problem with swelling in both legs and have to have tests to see if I have any cardiovascular disease. Is there any chance of blood clotting? So that is one question. That's from Ivor. Similarly, a question from Doug. My wife has had problems in the past involving DVTs. In is her hesitancy to get the AZ vaccine more justified? And finally, from Diana. 78-year-old senior with a history of previous deep vein thrombosis, which vaccine is better? So altogether, if you have a history of this kind of thing, deep vein thrombosis, what do you do? So uh, this is the question of the week, isn't it? So um, here, here's my take on the whole thing. Again, 37 cases in 5 million believed to be coincidental. So many experts have come and they said, we think this is just, we're just vaccinating millions of people and we're vaccinating the most vulnerable people. So they're going to have um, bad health outcomes just by virtue of age and the numbers that we're immunizing. But if you are concerned about a clot, I just want you to know this. We're looking at 37 cases in 5 million around this whole AstraZeneca issue, but if you looked at 5 million people hospitalized with COVID, you'd expect 100,000 to 500,000 of them to have clot. So COVID disease itself is a very pro-thrombotic. We know it causes problems with blood clotting. In some cases, one in three 
um, a patient in ICU with COVID disease had a thromboembolic event. So the longer you wait, not being protected, the more chance you have of getting the disease. And we know that COVID itself is associated with a much, much, much higher rate of um, uh, thromboembolic event or blood clots than even baseline and definitely more than they've seen in this vaccinated population. So keep in mind, in 5 million people hospitalized with COVID, you would have 100,000 to 500,000 clots. So. Um, as always, put that in perspective when you look at your risk of blood clotting at baseline versus if you had the disease versus having the vaccine. Okay. So if I'm interpreting correctly, you're very much in concert with those who say the risks are not, uh, the benefits far outweigh the risks at this point based on the information and the numbers we have. Now, maybe Absolutely. this question is part of that group. A question from Ray, not about DVT, but he's 62 and had a mini stroke a couple of years ago. Again, concerned about AstraZeneca for him. Would you put that in the last group of, uh, this would relate as well to that last answer? Absolutely. And we know what's interesting about COVID itself, the disease, it doesn't just cause clots in your veins, but it also causes clots in your arteries, which can then be associated with strokes. So again, even the, the, same, the same answer for anybody with concerns of clots, keep in mind the risk of the disease itself so much higher. And the more you wait, the less protected you are. Finally, for this hour, doctor, because thankfully you're coming back, Sue is wondering whether taking low-dose aspirin can prevent clots after the vaccine. Um, so I have to say that I'm not, I'm a pediatric infectious disease physician, and we don't, you know, this is not at all in my field of study, but um, I, I don't know whether that particular question has been looked at in terms of the vaccine studies. I'll go out on a limb that it probably hasn't, um, but, it, but overall, I just want you to remember that even in the vaccinated cohort that everybody's worried about in Europe, the rate, the baseline rate of clot is not higher than in the general population or what you'd expect and definitely so much lower than with COVID disease. So I would not start any medications or new medications uh, before or after the vaccine for this particular issue at all. This is a vaccine that has unfortunately developed a bit of a bad reputation for a number of things. Just uh, as we're talking, breaking news that the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is going to get the AstraZeneca vaccine when it's his turn. Starting to hear people trying to, to you know, put this publicly, that they are going ahead with this, that they too believe it is safe and, safe and efficacious and wanting to convey that to the public. We are just getting some breaking news from the World Health Organization. It promised a statement as it continues to look at the safety of the AstraZeneca vaccine that statement has just come out, and the concluding line is the most important. At this time, the World Health Organization considers that the benefits of the AstraZeneca vaccine outweigh its risks and recommends that vaccinations continue. We were waiting for that statement from the WHO, and it's been looking to the European Medicines Agency, looking at the data that it is studying. As you listen to that, the, the recommendation now, vaccinations continue regardless of these blood clot reports. Uh, and that the benefits outweigh the risks. Would you concur? Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's what everybody has been saying from the very beginning, and it's nice to see it being brought up by the WHO as well on an international level, um, and to remember that these vaccines are actively saving lives um, to people who otherwise would be at so much risk. So definitely uh, concur and happy to see that they've put out their statement. We have so many questions for you, doctor. So I'll get to some of them. And it's interesting, even though there are these repeated assurances from people that it is safe, there is a lot of confusion and there are still questions. Betty has one. If you were over 70 and offered the AstraZeneca vaccine at your appointment, can you refuse? And will you be given another option as in Pfizer or Moderna? Yeah, so none of these vaccines are being are mandatory. So people can refuse to have their vaccine. Now, when you would come up again to have another vaccine is different in every province uh, and questionable. And I would say if you're offered the vaccine, remember that when you do refuse, you are left at risk of COVID disease. And we're seeing a number of provinces starting to have the numbers go up of COVID cases again. So yet again, you're putting yourself at risk.
waiting for a different vaccine when we know that this vaccine works really well at preventing hospitalization, severity, and death. So keep that in mind as people try and pick and choose their vaccines. And just remember that one, one dose of this is still going to provide you good protection. Yes, there are reports of vaccine shopping, aren't there? And that's what people are discouraging. Interestingly, Betty says over 70, would she get the uh, AstraZeneca vaccine right now, Dr. Constantinescu? It's only Quebec offering that to people 65 and plus. But given the new guidance we got yesterday, other provinces are now looking at expanding that. So, Betty, thank you for starting us off. Laurel has a good question. My husband has MS and she has rheumatoid arthritis, so they are taking immunosuppressants. We live in a rural area, which is easy to isolate. We're both over 65. Based on our already compromised immune system, I feel we should wait for the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. Please comment. I mean, this has been one that we, we've talked about previously. There are many concerns and questions about vaccines for immunocompromised people, Dr. Constantinescu, and there's some new research that we're just getting just this very week in the Journal of American Medicine, for example, that speaks to it. So what would you say in response to Laurel there? Yeah, so right now, uh, that's exactly what we've been worried about in terms of the immunosuppressed people, not a safety with the vaccines because these are not live vaccines, about whether or not their, their immune system is going to respond as well to the vaccines as somebody who's not on immunosuppressants. And that study did show that people who have organ transplants and cancers, specifically blood cancer, can have a much lower rate of response after the first dose, um, and then their immunity also seemed to wane a bit faster, whereas, it, it, whereas with the second dose, that rate of response was higher, still not as high as somebody who's not immunosuppressed. So definitely a protection provider there. Um, in terms of whether you should wait or not, right now, NACI does recommend that um, the other, the mRNA vaccines be used. That recommendation comes out of not having enough evidence that the AstraZeneca vaccine works in that population as well. So that's where that's coming from. Not that it won't work, but we just don't have enough evidence to show that it does work, which is why the recommendation is there for the mRNA vaccines. So for sure, lower overall. Um, and it's possible that in time, these are the people we may need to boost again uh, versus the general the other the general population. So more information is coming out of that. Not a safety concern, but it does seem that they might have a lower response overall. Still, however, what we don't know is if you have a lower response, is it still really good enough to protect you against severity and death, which is what we're all worried about. And, you know, it that will come, and I suspect it'll be positive for that. Okay. That seemed to be very important research coming out this week, and I thought, as you as you raised, very interesting in if, if the immunity starts to wane, how perhaps for people who are immunocompromised, that four-month window between first and second doses, that might be too long. So they might have to look at shortening that for people in that situation. Again, these are some of the questions that researchers are seeking to answer. Um, I have a question from Graham for you, wondering about how we talk about the AstraZeneca shot and the blood clots in Europe and that Canada's batch, that's the word you hear, Canada's batch of the same vaccine was produced in India at the Serum Institute. How do we know it's not just the vaccine itself that's causing the blood clots and not a bad batch? I'm over 65, he writes. I'm very leery of this. Public confidence is resting on this and it's weak. Yeah, so uh, we don't know whether it's the batch or not, but th that's the first step in a safety response is to withdraw a batch. And the way the batch works are, is like this. So every vaccine has a lot number. When you go get your vaccine, you can actually see there's a lot number that gets recorded and tracked by the manufacturer, but also in Canada in terms of safety by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So there's a lot number that belongs to a batch. And the reason this whole batch idea has come about is like cohorting your vaccine. And the reason for this is that in the past, there have been batches that have been um, uh, infected, for example, contaminated with bacteria. So in that case, they were able to pull a whole batch to prevent an infection in the people of vaccine recipients. So that's the first step in a safety investigation is to say we're going to pull the batch. It doesn't mean that the batch is the problem, but that's like the one of the first few first few steps when you look at any signal of safety in a vaccine. So it's just part of the investigation. Um, the, the 
India versus, you know, where it is produced. Um, so in so you've heard that in Canada, we don't have the same batch as the EU. And we do have uh, some vaccine that is produced by the, by the Serum Institute in India, which is actually the world's largest producer of vaccines. And they still produce the AstraZeneca vaccine. So it's still that vaccine, but it's produced to different lot numbers and therefore a different batch in a different manufacturing company, a uh, different manufacturing site. Uh, by, by the same regulatory standard, Standards as you would have in other parts of the world. And it's just part of upscaling manufacturing. And India and the Serum Institute of India has been producing vaccines for many decades safely and well on a huge scale compared to some of the smaller plants in other parts of the world. Um, so we don't know whether it's the batch or not batch or whether this is all a coincidence, which was everybody tends to feel that it might be. But the batch pulling is kind of like your first step in the investigation. Okay. And finally, for us this morning, Rick in Montreal has a very interesting question, I think. He went out to get vaccinated just the other day, 77, by the way, thought he would receive AstraZeneca. Instead, the nurse told me, Rick writes, they ran out and offered me a generic called COVID Shield. Do you have any information about this? Yeah, so COVID Shield is the AstraZeneca and Oxford vaccine that's produced by the Student Institute in India. So it's just a different manufacturing plant. Remember, we're trying to immunize millions and millions of people. So we need to use any possible manufacturing plant that can make the vaccines. The Student Institute in India is the largest producer of vaccines in the world. They have to abide by the same safety and same regulatory standards as any other manufacturing plant under AstraZeneca. Um, as the AstraZeneca would have their vaccine manufactured in, and they've done it safely and well for decades. So for example, they pro produce most of the developing world vaccines, there are other, com other manufacturing plants as well that do it. So it's really the same vaccine. It's just manufactured in a different manufacturing site. That's an important question. I, I saw a little social media post yesterday from someone saying, you know, all my life, I've never given any thought to who manufactures the vaccines that I've received. But because of this new illness and the world effort to vaccinate, I mean, we're talking about manufacturers in a way we never have before, aren't we? That's right. And also we're talking about people being more educated and needing nuanced information more than ever before, which is great in a lot of ways, you know, that people are now aware of vaccinology, how things are produced. But to your point, you know, we've all been getting different flu vaccines for many years and nobody even knew that there was more than one type of flu vaccine in the past. So it's great that our population is getting really educated around this and more interested in how vaccines are manufactured and delivered.